Welcome everyone to Slither 33. How about that? I didn't start it the way these Slithers tend to start first time. Um, today I am very happy to be joined by colleague and friend Barb Reisner, and she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, implementing a masked and scaffolded search. Um, just a little note on this, uh, we're going to have time at the end for questions, but then we are going to have a little Slither After Dark session in which we can ask questions, but they will not be recorded for the YouTube channel. Uh, as some of the topics might get a little sensitive and might not be able to be recorded and posted for posterity. So um, stick around when I stop recording at the end uh, if you have any additional questions. If you have a question you're perhaps not sure about if it should be asked live or during the after dark session, uh, maybe throw it in the chat and uh, hopefully Barb would get a chance to look at it and address it if she felt she could while we were recording. Um, but uh, wait until afterwards later. So with me yapping more than enough, Barb, take it away. Thanks so much, Chip. So um, as Chip mentioned, I'm going to talk about the masked and scaffolded search that we did at JMU last fall. We had the opportunity to hire on multiple positions. We were hiring for both tenure track and renewable term lecture positions. And I um, trying to have an inclusive and equitable search was something that was really important for our department. Um, it's part of our culture here, but we also want to make these positions as accessible to as wide a group of people as possible. And Lynette, our department had, um, had this idea that we should try doing a masked and scaffolded search. And so the search committee was charged with developing this process while we were doing the search. So today, what I'm gonna tell you about is what I did last fall with the JMU 2022 cohort hire um, and how this happened. And I do need to acknowledge some people before I start. It's probably maybe a strange topic to do acknowledgements for, but um, this was really a community effort. Um, the idea for this came from our department head. She championed it with our faculty, with our administration. Um, and then the search committee was charged with implementing it. And so all of this was developed by the search committee as a whole. So I wanna acknowledge Donna Menta, Daniel Blumling, Chrissy Huey, Ching Cheng Liu, and Isaiah Sumner, who are a search committee because they put in an immense amount of work in developing this process and um, had to do more than just reviewing candidate materials. We have an amazing administrative assistant and we had to lean on her heavily through this process. So a big thank you to Jill Hagmeyer. And then our human resources department provided some invaluable training and resources for our department and was also involved with the review of applicants and um, our associate provost for diversity and executive director for faculty access and inclusion, David Owusu-Ansa. Um, was heavily involved with just helping us like making sure we were aware of lots of things. So uh, lots of thank yous to lots of people. So um, I wanna talk about a masked and scaffolded search. I think the idea of a mass search is something that people are familiar with. Um, there are lots of instances in the literature and popular media about bias and hiring. It can be from resume review for a position for a lab tech or maybe an audition for an orchestra. Um, and one of the nice things about masking a search is it's a way to minimize implicit bias. And that's something that was very important to us, minimizing this as part of our search. To do this, we had to make sure we didn't know the identity of our candidates or we weren't biased for having come from certain groups or certain institutions. So we wanted to mask the identity of all of our candidates. Now, the idea of a mass search is probably familiar, but the scaffolded one may be less so. And this was something that was new to me. And the goal for a scaffolded search is to provide supports to make sure that the process is equitable for our candidates. And I don't know if you're familiar with this image. This is an image I've seen a lot over the past few years, which I think does a really good job of capturing this idea of why we might want to scaffold a search. Um, we make the assumption oftentimes that everybody has the same support. So in the context of hiring, 
we're assuming that everyone knows how hiring works and that everyone's getting good mentoring for how to put together an application. However, we know that that's not the case. Not everyone has information about what the hiring process looks like. Not all candidates have good access to information or mentoring, and that puts them in a disadvantage to put together a competitive application. And we wanted to make sure all of our candidates knew what we were looking for, and it wasn't a secret. We wanted this process to be as visible as, as, visible as a hiring process can be, of course. Um, and so if we're going to attract diverse candidates from diverse backgrounds and environments, we needed to make this job process transparent. So throughout this process, not only did we anonymize things, but we also tried to provide support for our candidates at each phase of the interview process so they could feel like they had the information about what it was we were looking for. So the other thing I'm gonna point out this was a big learning curve for us. This was something new, and I will freely admit that our process was far from perfect, but we felt like it was a step in the right direction. And I feel like it's important to acknowledge this. After you've done something, you know a lot more in hindsight, you just know a whole lot more. We're proud of the search that we did, but obviously at this point, there were things we would have done differently. So at this point, I'm gonna walk you through the mechanics of this process. Um, how we advertised, what we provided to our candidates, how we did the review. And as questions come up, if something I say is incompletely explained or unclear, please feel free to put something in the chat. I have it up, so hopefully I can address questions as they come up. So the first part is the advertisement. So we began this process last year in late August when we finally got permission to hire. And with the late start for us, our goal was to move very quickly through this. Um, as I mentioned before, we were hiring on two types of position, um, renewable lecturers and tenure track. And our advertisement was really put out so that this was the initial phase of the review. Um, this is part of the advertisement. It was in chemical and engineering news. Um, but we asked for only two things. We asked for a cover letter and a Vita. Um, and then we told the candidates what we wanted with respect to the cover letter. We wanted to know about their qualifications, their commitment to contributing to an equitable and inclusive environment. Um, for the lecturer candidates, we asked them to describe their potential to teach undergraduates in the lower division, which is where primarily our lecturers teach. And for tenure track, we wanted to know about their research interests and how undergraduates would play a role. One of the things that I hope you notice is that we didn't ask for research statements, we didn't ask for teaching statements. We did ask them to keep it to three pages, these cover letters. Um, and we did not ask for any letters of reference at this point. So this was for an initial review phase um, to just get the ball rolling. We did a lot of advertising for this. Um, through our human resources department, we went to chemical and engineering news. We advertised with SACNIS, Nobuche, and diversityjobs.com. And then the faculty in our department, we did our best to distribute this to as wide of a possible audience as possible. We posted um, with the ACS divisions of nuclear and analytical chemistry. We did job boards, ASBMB, PER, all sorts of places. We reached out to our community. So I had an advertisement on the Ionic Discord for the community. We reached out to the Facebook group, the Leadership Alliance, Twitter, LinkedIn, everything we can think of, we reached out to. So we have a large faculty, so we were able to hit a number of resources. The other advertising we did was through the form of targeted letters. And again, this was a full faculty effort. We all reached out to our professional networks um, and sent letters and asked for um, graduate students and postdocs to apply. Um, we had retirements in analytical and inorganic chemistry. So we were very interested in reaching those communities. Um, one community that we specifically reached out to were faculty who teach or, or who have research in nuclear chemistry. ACS has a listserv of those, or a list and a listserv of those faculty. And so we specifically reached out to them. We went to the Diversify Chemistry website and any chemistry graduate student or postdoc who marked that they were interested in academics and graduating in 2022 or had already graduated, um, 
they got a letter from me inviting them to apply with information about the position. And then a resource we learned about from our HR department, the registry. Um, we, I, I sent letters to everybody who listed their primary discipline as chemistry and just a generic, here's our position. We encourage you to apply sort of thing. Um, so through this process, we got a number of applica applicants for both of our pools. We effectively were doing two searches in one because we had a tenure track pool and we also had a lecturer pool. And we kind of went back and forth between the pools to keep this process going. So in terms of the masking, um, for these preliminary packets that we got, we had to lean heavily on our department administrative assistant. And what Jill would do is she would assign each applicant a number. So she knew who the applicant, what name went with what applicant. And what she did is she redacted institutions, advisors, names from all of the cover letters. We did not specify to be anonymous in our advertisement. And through this process, we discovered that redacting the CVs was really just too much work to do, um, especially for someone who had not trained as a chemist. Um, and so we worked from the cover letters at this, this stage of the interview. Um, so we got a list of files that were renamed. It was basically one letter to letter and for a tenure track or lecturer, they had that designation. And then I got a spreadsheet from our admin that identified the candidate number, what degrees they had. So um, it, this, this will depend on which search we're in and their veteran status because that's part of the review process at James Madison. So that was sent to me and then we could use that as we look through the cover letters to make sure that each candidate had the degree that we asked for through the review process. So at this point, we also learned about um, Yale Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry search. If you haven't seen this, I encourage you to Google the Yale MBMB faculty hiring best practices because they did a search like this that was um, anonymized the year before. And they have a lot of tips online. We unfortunately learned about them after our advertisement, but they've done a really nice job of writing these things up. And they also had the rubrics that they used for candidate evaluation, which we used to develop our own rubrics as we went through this process. So as I said, it was effectively two searches. We had different review criteria for the lecturer position and the tenure track faculty. For the lecturer position, um, each of the packets, which was really the redacted cover letter, was reviewed by three of the committee members. And we had it so that it wasn't always the same three people reviewing. We had kind of a phased review, but everyone got through reviews. Our spreadsheet told us whether they had a master's or not. Um, and whether they were a veteran. And then these questions focused on um, their commitment to teaching undergraduates, their interest in teaching at the lower division and their prior teaching experience. And these are things that we scored as acceptable. Um, it was addressed, but in a very limited fashion or not addressed. Um, and the weighting scheme we used is there. And we also looked at their comments or their, their um, statement on um, diversity, equity, inclusion, knowledge, and commitment, because this is something that was a part of our advertisement and something that was very important to us as a department. And if they did not address these things at all, these candidates were removed from our applicant pool. So that was considered the initial criteria. Um, and I have a question in the chat about sharing the rubrics. Um, we are in the process of cleaning things up to share and we're hoping to publish a um, short paper on our search process. So this is something that we will be sharing at some point. Um, just, it might take us a little bit more time, especially at the end of the semester to get this all done. But we will eventually be sharing all of this with the community. And if you'd like informally to see some of this beforehand, just get in touch with me and I'm happy to chat more about it. So that was the lecturer search. Um, the tenure track search, we are not only looking at teaching and all of that, but we have slightly different criteria. Research plays a much more prominent role here. So again, our review criteria were acceptable, limited, or not addressed. Um, for the tenure track positions, the qualifications, we wanted to know if they had a PhD and a postdoc. 
um, their veteran status, their commitment to undergraduates. James Madison is a primarily undergraduate institution. The highest degree we offer is a bachelor's in chemistry. So if you're interested in working with PhD students, this is not a good fit for you. Um, we wanted to know about their research interests. Basically, could they clearly articulate research interests? Did they describe their prior work? And again, um, their commitment and knowledge of DEI was important. And just like the lecturer pool, if they did not address this, they were disqualified from the pool at this point because it was part of the advertisement. We specifically called this out. So in terms of the mechanics, um, those were the elements of the rubrics. Each of our um, committee member reviewers scored all of the applicants that they were assigned. Um, and that was all sent to me. Those of you who know me know that I love spreadsheets and this all got organized into one master spreadsheet um, where we had the scores, the three scores for each candidate. And then we also had an average score for the candidate. And the philosophy for us at this stage was to get more information from anyone we thought could be more could be successful. So we did have candidates who were disqualified because they didn't mention DEI in any part of their cover letter. Um, and the way we move people forward is that we had a minimum average score from our three um, committee raters. Um, if they met that score, they automatically moved forward. If they had a champion, if there was one person who scored them highly, even if other members of the committee didn't, they automatically move forward. Um, there were some candidates with very, very low scores. We did not discuss if those candidates, but anyone in kind of in the middle um, were discussed. And if we felt there was something worth finding more about with that candidate, we moved that packet forward um, and we cut our search pool down about to 50% of the original applicants at this point. Um, at each phase of the search process, we do have to go through our human resources department and they um, look at the demographics of our search pool and our human resources department certified our pool. They told us that it was a diverse pool and we were allowed to um, proceed. So at that point, I got the names from our HR um, person, um, I'm sorry, the names from our admin, um, but without the numbers. And I sent emails to all of the applicants who were moving on to the second phase, asking them for more materials. Um, we gave them 10 days because we were trying to move quickly with the search and um, ask, they were asked to send the materials to the admin. At this point, we were a little wiser about the process. Um, and so we were much more specific with what and how we requested things of our applicants. So this is our secondary review stage. We asked for statements that were no more than 1200 words. And I'm going to talk about the tenure track process at this point, the lecturer process proceeded in parallel, but it's easier just to talk about one. So I picked this one because there's more to it. Um, we asked our candidates to describe their goals and vision for their future research program at the JMU environment and how they would create an equitable and inclusive learning environment for students in class, in lab, and in other learning spaces. Um, so this was our general statement. We sent this. We sent our diversity statement and a link to our diversity plan and where we are in implementing this plan. Or, and. Um, we also gave them specific instructions on how to mask. We asked them to admit their name, their mentor names, institution names, journal names, because we wanted to just focus on the science and their discussion of teaching diversity, equity, and inclusion that they had in those statements. And we gave them examples. Um, and we based this very much on what Yale MBNB did because they have a great model for this. Um, so we said, this is what an anonymized statement looks like. You'll notice that there are no names. There are no um, workshop titles for this example. We don't refer to specific professors or how meritorious professors or institutions are. So what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And that we made that very explicit. Now those guidelines I just told you about were a little general. So we gave them the specific questions that we wanted to know the answers to. We decided what it was we wanted to know about our applicants and then wrote questions 
to provide to them to get at the things that were going to be in our scoring rubric. So we want to know how well does the candidate identify and define their research direction? Does it demonstrate independence? How well are the broader impacts of the research articulated? How strong is the plan to bring publications prior to tenure? And what's the timeline? Um, obtaining, cert, trying to get funding, um, applying for funding and publishing are important parts of our um, tenure and promotion process. And we wanna make this clear to candidates from the get-go. Um, what's their plan to train and recruit and retain undergraduates? We keep hitting on this idea of we're an undergraduate institution. Um, how does the equipment that we have match their needs? And if it doesn't match their needs, what are their plans to collaborate? Um, what are the plans for startup funding? And what experiences do you have to make it that you're capable of doing this research? So we ask these things about research um, and you'll see that the these are the elements of the rubric. These are the broad categories. Um, this is reflected in the rubric. And for our faculty reviewers, we had a description of what things each one of these look like. Did they clearly articulate their research question? Did they have a, a well-defined concrete plan? Were they able to articulate their problem in the broader chemical sciences, the timeline? How do they involve undergraduates? Um, is it feasible to do at James Madison University or do they have a plan to get other, to use other resources and then the other thing which I mentioned before is we have an inorganic and an analytical chemist retiring. And so people in those areas did get an additional bump up for fulfilling a department need. This was not something that we advertised. Um, we wanted an open search because we wanted the best candidates possible, but we recognize that we have needs in the department. And so that was part of our rubric. Um, Things were generally scored as not present or poor, um, vague, or were they clear, reasonable, and detailed? And we had a spreadsheet where we could just score each candidate on each of these dimensions, and we had a rubric next to us. With the research statements, these were scored by two committee members. Um, the committee divided these up based on kind of generic research area. And we brought in a third faculty member. Most of the faculty in our department did attend hiring training to learn about best practices in hiring. And we wanted to be able to um, have research experts within the department review these applications. For example, the committee did not have a biochemist on it and we had a number of biochemistry applications. And so our biochemistry faculty, um, they help review these. We gave them the rubric, they scored it, um, and that was provided back to the committee. We also made sure that we didn't have three of the same type of chemists reviewing an applicant. We are a fairly large department, so it's feasible that we could have three analytical chemists reviewing an application, and we wanted to make sure that there was someone out of field reviewing it to make sure that it was understandable to someone who was out of field. Then we also scaffolded our teaching and diversity statement. Um, we asked about how to create an equitable and uh, equitable learning environment and um, how do they make use of their own experiences and their own personal attributes to meet this goals. Um, we asked about the goals they had for their students. How do they define and measure student success? How does the candidate demonstrate knowledge and awareness of DEI issues in higher ed? And how do they plan to promote this as a JMU faculty member through all of the elements of their job? Um, do they discuss approaches to engage students? Um, and do they consider the impact of these approaches on learners with diverse backgrounds, expectations, and needs? And then finally, we asked how they plan to continually develop as a teacher. And you'll see that the rubric for this um, mirrors what we sent to the candidates. Those are the exact questions that were sent to the candidates. Um, and so we were, we were scoring them based on these same things with the same criteria, not present or poor. Was it there but vague or was it clear, reasonable and detailed? Um, so it's a pretty broad level of scoring, but that made it a whole lot easier. Um, 
These are the elements that we scored on. And this was scored by two committee members. For the tenure track search, the teaching statements were only reviewed by the committee. For our renewable term lecturer search, we had um, all of our renewable term lecturers participate. We asked them to participate. And if they went to hiring training, they were able to score these. And we got lots of feedback from them. They provided in the inf information and in, they scored it according to our rubric. Um, at this point, we had not looked at the VITAs. These were really hard to anonymize, which made it a problem, but we felt that at this stage, it was important to see what was there. So we asked two of our more experienced faculty who were not committee members to review the um, VITAs of the faculty who made it, or the candidates who made it to the secondary review. And so they saw the names and numbers and they, for each faculty number, which is how we identified our candidates, they told us what they perceive their area to be, what their teaching and TA experience and undergraduate research mentoring experience was based on the VITA. And they did a holistic publication review for us. So they told us, were the publications light? were they good or were they just like outstanding and at where in their career they had published. So we had this very broad information. We had no names. We just knew them from the candidate number that candidate number one had just a superlative publication record, had mentored undergraduates in the lab and was whatever type of chemist they were. So we are back to the spreadsheets. Everybody scored according to the spreadsheets. Again, this all got merged um, and every one of our tenure track candidates had three research scores and two teaching scores. Um, and for we advanced on to the phone interview stage. It was about 15% of our pool. Anyone who had the minimum average, who had a champion, and for the ones who had middle scores, there was a discussion amongst the committee to decide whether we wanted to advance to the phone interview stage or not. At this point, once we had a list, um, these numbers were forwarded to our admin who forwarded the names without the, associating with the number to our department head um, to, make, to make sure we were good at this point. It was sent to HR to certify that we maintained a diverse pool um, and we were certified at all levels. So those names, um, I got those names and I sent everyone a list of what we would be asking during our Zoom interview and our administrative assistant arranged for the Zoom interviews. So, the Zoom interview itself was scaffolded. Um, we provided everyone with the questions that we were going to ask during the phone interview, as well as some resources that they could use to find out more information if they chose to do so. So we asked, why is the JMU environment attractive? We sent them links to the chemistry department, to the university, to the surrounding area so that they could know more about the department, the institution, the area. We asked how they could support underprepared students in a general chemistry program because many of our faculty teach in general chemistry and we see students with a range of preparation and this is something that's important to us to address. So we hope that people could talk about this, but we told them what we were doing in our general chemistry lectures to support our students and the resources we had available. So they understood the context of our general chemistry better and what we were already doing for students. We wanted to know what they were interested in teaching and what they were able to teach because we do have specific departmental needs. There are certain types of chemists which could make help us out a lot more than other areas of chemistry. And of course, how would they create an inclusive environment? We sent them links to the catalog and the courses. We told them how big the courses are, what the style of courses are, so they'd have more information. We asked about instrumentation, equipment, safety, and collaboration needs pre-tenure. Um, we sent the list of instrumentation that we have, and of course, a lot of this is available on our website. We wanted to know about their long-term professional goals. We were interested to know how they see themselves developing over their career as a faculty member. And then because we were hiring on multiple faculty positions, we are, this is a cohort hire. We have a group of faculty who are going to have shared experiences and we hope we'll work with each other and build community as they grow as JMU faculty members. 
We ask what they're going to bring to you and benefit from, from being part of a cohort. And then of course, any questions that they have for us. So that's what they got. And we did our best to mask at this stage of the process. I will say that I did know first and last names of the applicants at this point, but the rest of the committee only knew first names. Um, all of our phone interviews, Zoom interviews, um, had three committee members and the applicant present. I was at every one of these interviews unless I had a conflict of interest. Um, and these were recorded. We had our applicants put their first names only up. We had our first names only up, although it was probably pretty obvious who we were. Um, and we asked everyone to remove their pictures and to keep a blank screen for the process of the Zoom, Zoom interview. And these were recorded because it is impossible to schedule six people to be in one place at the same time. And this way, the people who weren't able to attend a particular phone interview were able to review it prior to discussing the candidates. So after each phone interview, we did a short debrief and a preliminary ranking of our candidates. Were they just outstanding, blow us away, um, acceptable, that level of ranking. Um, and then we asked the committee to review all of our applicants for a full committee discussion. Um, we brought in the holistic publication review and um, based on this information and discussion, we made a recommendation for on sites. This was first sent to the Dean and the department head to look over the candidates and give us a thumbs up. Um, they were very pleased with our candidates and we sent on to human resources to certify that we were maintaining a diverse pool. We got our certification and we move forward at this stage. Let's try this one, there we go. So for on-site interviews, obviously it's impossible to do an anonymized interview. Um, at this point, we provided the committee and the search committee, everybody on the faculty with full information. They got the unredacted cover letter. They got the VITA. They got the teaching and diversity statement and the research statement that our candidates did for review prior to the candidate's visit. But we did wanna to continue to scaffold this process. And so we have different instructions for our two different searches at this point. Um, we gave guidelines for the research seminar and the setup just about the audience, about the room, about the technology. And then all of our, our tenure track candidates not only give a research seminar, which is also meant to serve as a teaching demonstration, and we do tell them that, but we also have a research proposal presentation and we gave them guidelines and the setup. We asked them to talk about their research plan, resources, the timeline for the research program, how they're going to disseminate the sustainability and the undergraduate involvement. And for example, we would provide them with the types of questions that we would ask during the, um, we, we could ask during the proposal process. So I give you the example of resources. What instrumentation will you use? What will you need to purchase? What's going to be done through collaboration? What about the experiments? Are they done through collaboration with Hume? With whom? What are the contributions of the candidate and the collaborator? Collaborator, what are your anticipated startup costs? Provide a budget. So we wanted to get specific information about all of these and all of those categories that I gave you. We provided a list of questions to every single one of our candidates. Um, for the lecturers, it was a slightly different. Um, set of questions. Lecturers give a teaching demonstration that's meant to be 45 minutes to show us the classroom environment that they want to create. Um, and faculty and students, we participate as students or what in whatever way our candidate prefers. And if they need special need, if they have special needs like model kits or, kits or technology to let us know, we um, let them know that this is how we're going to evaluate how you teach and coach students and your commitment to fostering a diverse and inclusive environment. We gave each of our lecturers a scenario because most of our lecturers teach in our general or organic program. We have a, one scenario for each one. Um, and we told them and sent them pictures about the teaching space and the technology that we have available just to make it as clear as possible for everybody participating in the process. So. These, this information was sent. 
we spent a lot of time in interviews towards the end of the semester. It was exhausting, but I am very happy to say that we are thrilled to be welcoming four new faculty members next fall to our department. So I focused on the mechanics of this process. I haven't talked about numbers. I haven't talked about identities any of these things because this is really meant to be the mechanics. These are the parts that I know that I am allowed to share. And hopefully you have a better idea of the process that we used. Um, was it perfect? No. Do we have ideas for how to do it differently? Most certainly. But the thing I can say is at every stage of this process, we felt like we just had an outstanding candidate pool. And it was really wonderful to see just the quality of the applications that we got. And when our candidates came to campus, the, the, it was just, it was really, we were very impressed with everything. Um, and I think a lot of it was providing this information. They told us what we needed to know because we asked. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to open up the floor to questions and hopefully you have a sense of how to implement a masked and scaffolded search. Thanks, Barb. Um, we'll take some general questions for now and uh, be prepared to shut down the recording in a bit. Um, does anyone have any questions for Barb? There was one in the chat, but based on your final statements, I think we'll wait until after the recording ends. Um, it looks like, did someone have their hand raised? I think that was a clap up, but Joanne's got something. And uh, so, so I'm curious uh, what kind of feedback uh, you've gotten from the candidates, either the successful or the failed candidates at this point in time. We had, we got, uh, I can't remember when it was. We did a search one time and it might've even been a failed search. I don't remember now. It was a long time ago. And we, we actually went back to the candidates and several of them agreed to talk with us afterwards um, about what worked and what didn't work and so on. And it was incredibly useful. So I'm just wondering, I imagine you've probably gotten, without asking for it, you've probably gotten some feedback along the way. And I wondered if you're gonna go out and try to get some more formal feedback, maybe from your successful candidates. We, we haven't, thanks for the question, Joanne. We haven't gone to solicit formal feedback from candidates, but you're right, we did get informal feedback from a number of candidates. And um, we got a lot of feedback appreciating how um, DEI was a part of the search, but also how transparent we made the search and how accessible and how they just felt like they were cared for with all of the directions. So we did get that that feedback from a number of candidates, but it's it's anecdotal, it's not anything. Because I'd be curious if it's, you know, I wonder if it's uh, if it's hard to make, you know, anonymous statements and, and because, uh, or maybe it's not that hard to do that. I'd be really curious what, what the candidates would have to say about that. And as you said, you've got, uh, you've got additional ideas now about how to make that work even better. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'd be really curious what the, what the candidates have to say about that, that part of the process. I, I will say the one place where we got pushback was 1200 words. People did not, there were several people who commented that 1200 words was too few. Um, but actually I have to say that having been on search committees before this 1200 word limit was actually really nice because you had to present, present, present a clear and concise Plan and it was very easy. It made the search process a whole lot easier to review applicants, which was it was nice. Hi, I just wanted to make kind of make a comment on that. Um, so, full disclosure, um, I actually did apply to this position, um, and then I withdrew from the process partway through because I accepted a position elsewhere. Um, and so I would say this of uh, the positions I applied to was the only one that had this fully scaffold and mass type of um, search. Um, and so I, I personally really, I, I would echo the commitment to DEI um, involved in it. Um, and then also having that scaffold really, it made me feel a lot more confident in what I was providing and that I was actually providing the right information to represent myself best. 
So I really appreciated it from this point of view. Thank you for sharing that. Kathy, sure. Yes, thank you so much, Barbara. This is great. Um, I can imagine my colleagues asking about how long it takes to run a search like this from beginning to end, that you mentioned um, that you get to some of the information, you're going back to the candidates. Did this search take more time, less time um, from, from posting the ad to the hire, would you say? I would say that um, post, posting the ad to the, the hiring process, um, took the same amount of time. We started later than we would have liked. Um, and that was just because we didn't have the positions until later than we would have liked to have known. But the amount of time it took for the search was about the same. Now, the committee will tell you I was kind of relentless with deadlines. Um, and I pushed very hard on maintaining a schedule. Um, and we just, we, we set a schedule, we agreed on it and we just made it happen. And so it, that's, I think, part of the reason it took us the same amount of time. That's great, thank you. I could imagine colleagues say it will take too long and it's good to know it can be done in the same time footprint. Yeah, you, yeah. You, just, you, just have to, you just have to set the schedule. And honestly, going down to reviewing, or doing a full review on half of the applicants, then a full review on all of the applicants. I mean, that in and of itself made that part of the review phase take less time. It was shorter and we had fewer because we were reviewing candidates who were interested in being at a PUI and had some commitment to DEI. Other questions before I hit Barb with one or perhaps two. So um, I'm guessing, you know, if, if we think about our, our teaching experience, you give what you think are clear instructions to students and then they don't answer your questions. Um, would you say a rough percentage that might have been culled by not following instructions along the way were? Oh gosh. I have to be honest, it's been so long and so many things have happened. I don't know that I can comment on a percentage, but at I can say at every stage, we had people who didn't follow instructions. I mean, even when we gave those detailed guidelines, there were people who omitted things. Um, for the most part, people were pretty good with the anonymizing part. Um, there, there were lapses. Um, and we did not have Yale's graduate students to go through every application and redact stuff, which is how Yale did it. They enlisted and paid their graduate students to do it. Um, but people just omitted, omitted stuff. And when you're omitting stuff and it's a clearly stated thing, you're obviously not going to score as well when that is one of the questions. So, yeah, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell you a percentage. So... Not zero, that's-, that's It's non-zero, correct. And did you feel, you, there were some comments on the, the 1200 words or so, did you feel that was enough to get anything media across without being so surfacy? Cause it just, to me, seemed like you were asking for an awful lot to be covered. The, the one thing I admitted is we asked them to only present one project. So okay. in the past, we've had faculty present multiple projects, or that's what we've gotten. We haven't asked for it. We've gotten the three proposals sort of thing. We wanted to know, we said one, so that we felt like 1,200 words really was enough to talk about one in detail. So. And you, you mentioned that it was very open did it come down to any points where, you know, how do I compare physical chemist A to organic chemist B? Um, did that kind of go through the system okay? That, yeah, that, you know, that wasn't some, we were concerned about that when we started. Um, that just really wasn't, it didn't become an issue. And as I said before, we are a large department we probably could have gotten by without 
I mean, we, we could have hired in any area and we would have been okay. Um, we were just really fortunate to have outstanding candidates. So. I, I don't envision having that flexibility when we hire, it's going to have to be, we need yeah. somewhat narrow window X with some room, but yeah. And, and if you really do need that narrow window, you probably should not be doing an open area search. And yeah. so we knew, we knew we had that flexibility going in. Great. Uh, any other questions before we move to the after dark portion of our slither here today. Well, if not, I want to take this moment to formally thank Barb for posterity's sake uh, for, for doing this. And I will, as soon as I find the right button and the recording,